Okay. I call this talk here Ireland, Paris, and climate change, laggard or leader. And here I'm going to be focusing on the Paris Agreement and Ireland's role in making its fair contribution um, to deliver on the commitments wrapped up into that agreement. But I'm going to start with just some headline um, comments on, on what we are certain about from the science, just to make this really clear. First, the greenhouse effect is uncontested. That the Earth is much warmer than it would normally be relative to its position from the sun is uncontested. And without the greenhouse effect, the atmosphere around the Earth, then we would be about 33 degrees Kelvin or degrees centigrade cooler. In other words, an average global temperature of about minus 18 degrees centigrade. And the science is absolutely clear about this. Climate change is also uncontested. The balance of incoming and outgoing radiation has and will always fluctuate, regardless of whether humans are on the planet or not. That humans contribute to, contribute to recent um, warming is also uncontested. There are some very slight differences um, in, in assessments of what level uh, the humans have contributed to this, but broadly there's a, there's a high level of agreement and we all accept that humans are the main cause of recently observed climate change. The exact, the exact level of human future induced climate change is contested, but just a little. It depends on exactly how um, sensitive the atmosphere is to our emissions and of course on the level of emissions that we put into the atmosphere. As it is at the moment, we are very likely to see a two degree C rise by about 2050 there or, about, there or thereabouts. And if we carry on at current sort of levels of emissions, probably near a four degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And it's just worth bearing in mind the difference between today and the ice age is about five degrees. So we'll be occurring, what, what we will be doing was from our emissions, we'll be making a change in about 100 years that would normally occur um, within about a geological period, like between ice ages. Now I'm going to start the sort of framing of this talk, actually borrowing from the Pope's encyclical on climate change, which is really an excellent document in both the science and the social science and the politics around climate change. And obviously there's a strong spiritual dimension if you want to read that as well, but I think it captures the broad essence of why it is we're struggling to deal with climate change well in this particular quote. He notes here that the alliance of technology and economics ends up sidelining anything unrelated to its immediate interests. Whereas any genuine attempt to introduce change is viewed as a nuisance based on romantic illusions. In other words, really, the difficult things that we need to do on climate change, we are closing that debate down by referring to them as being romantic illusions. And he, he is making the point we need to open that box up and that's where the real attempts, the genuine attempts are to address climate change. I'm going to try and talk through more of those later on in this presentation. So what of Ireland in this, um, in this uh, debate and discussion around climate change? Well, Ireland has committed to deliver on the Paris Agreement, to take action, to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees centigrade of warming above pre-industrial levels, and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. To do this in accordance with the best science, the an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, being a good guide of that, and very importantly, on the basis of equity. And broadly, that means that poorer parts of the world have longer to make the transition away from fossil fuels than the wealthy industrialized parts, such as Ireland, the UK, the EU, and so forth. But to whom are these commitments made? Well, firstly, they're very clearly made to the poor um, communities living in more climatically vulnerable zones elsewhere in the world. And these people already, many of them are, are suffering from climate change. But they're also made to our own children tomorrow. Well, our, the children we have today and their lives tomorrow. But they're also made, of course, to future generations, because what we're talking about are changes that will be occurring for centuries, if not millennia. And we're also making this commitment to other species, to ecosystems, whether that's the barrier reef or the rainforest, but indeed the insects that pollinate our cro crops. So we have these commitments on climate change that are made really to future generations to, and to our own children's prospects. But before we start on climate change, I think we have to remind, to, to, well, to discuss the issues around climate change. We must remind ourselves where we are today. We need to be sort of brutally honest about where we're starting from. And very seldom are we honest, even about the starting point. The first IPCC report came out in 1990. Um, so that is what, 27, 28 years ago now. Yet in 2016, Ireland's emissions of carbon dioxide were around 25% higher than they were in 1990, if you include aviation um, and shipping. Um, so despite the fact that we'd had 28 years, over a quarter of a century, to do something about this, Ireland's emissions have continued to rise. And the CO2 emissions are almost certainly will still be rising this year. So against the, all of the science knowledge that we had 
back in 1990, we are still seeing a rise in emissions. So despite optimistic rhetoric, Ireland has delivered 27 years of abject failure in terms of reducing its total emissions. Now that could be said for some other countries, but indeed for industrialized countries, Ireland actually is, is really quite surprising here and its emissions are still going up so rapidly indeed. Now at an international level, but of course also with Ireland and um, the EU and more widely, there've been a whole litany of technocratic frauds as to why we are not seeing any significant reductions in our emissions. We had offsetting, which was, uh, if you like, you know, paying for indulgences or paying the poor to diet for us. We had the clean development mechanism, which is really just a state sanctioned version of offsetting. We had the emissions trading scheme, scheme which still works, of course, within, the, uh, within Europe. But there are so many permits that the price of carbon dioxide remains incredibly low. So it's had virtually no effect in reducing emissions. We're now relying on future negative emission technologies at a huge planetary scale to suck CO2 directly from the atmosphere. These technologies do not exist, but we're relying on those. And we're also talking already now about science fiction in terms of geoengineering, where we're going to you know, pump sulfates into the stratosphere to re reflect sunlight back out into space. You know, this is like a sticking plaster on gangrene. It's not going to work. In 27, 28 years, we have not yet seriously tried mitigation. And I'm going to focus really on the mitigation side here. But there are plenty of things that we can do there. The real take home messages to consider, and I've taken out a lot of the sort of science behind all of this. So I'm trying to cut it really right back to Ireland. The real take home messages to consider are first that it's carbon budgets that matter, not long term targets about 20, 30, 40, 50, etc. That the Paris commitment is far more challenging than most politicians admit. That real mitigation is still possible for two degrees centigrade just. So there the headline points, I think, are really important in developing any legislation about climate change. So what are carbon budgets? Because it's an expression that many people have heard, but I think a lot of people don't really understand quite what it means. What we know clearly from the science is that temperature relates to the total quantity of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere. So we have a carbon budget that we can emit for uh, two degrees centigrade and obviously a smaller carbon budget for 1.5. That's the, temp the carbon dioxide we can emit over this coming century, but mostly really over the next few decades. So here we can see carbon dioxide emissions going up on the, on the, uh, um, on the left hand axis and along the bottom you'll see the years from 1990. So we have um, a sort of stylized view of, of recent emissions at the global level. And what really matters is the area under the curve, the carbon budget, not what happens in 2040 or 2050, but actually the total amount of carbon dioxide. So if we choose in the short term for our emissions to continue to rise by increasing aviation, for example, or increasing agriculture, then what we have to do, or not we, of course, future generations will have to do is to compensate for our choice not to bother to, claim, to respond to climate change today by doing a lot more in the future, if that is at all possible. So we are locked into a certain carbon budget for these temperature thresholds that we've agreed to. Now, if we try to align Paris with two degrees centigrade, and notice here, I'm already really moving away from 1.5 and many parts of the world, particularly Bangladesh and the association of small island states in the Pacific, argued very strongly in Paris that we need a 1.5 degree C target because they're fully aware that for those parts of the world, many people will suffer. Um, but I'm going to focus here more on two degrees centigrade um, because I don't actually think any longer that 1.5 looks a viable temperature threshold. So I think those communities are going to suffer anyway because of our failure to date in reducing our emissions. So focus on two degrees centigrade here. Now, I'm just laying out the method in a really sort of simple uh, four point uh, plan here. The first thing we need to do is to link via the best science, the Paris two degrees C commitment to a global carbon budget range. And we can do that quite clearly from the from the science. We then need to think about here a focus on the poorer parts of the world. This is actually dominated by China, but indeed India and the continent of Africa and so forth. And let's think that they could deliver. Imagine that they could deliver very early peaks in their rising emissions and then subsequently start to mitigate increasingly rapidly across the next decade or two. So very, very ambitious for the poorer parts of the world. We can then estimate what the carbon budget range is for those poorer parts of the world. The remaining portion of the global carbon budget for two degrees centigrade, we can then fairly attribute or portion to different countries in the OECD, including Ireland or um, I've done, recently done some work for Sweden and the UK on this. Um, or indeed the EU or the US. So you can work out what is the fair carbon budget for Ireland and you would have a range. Now the headline message 
for Ireland is really quite challenging, but it's very similar to that of the UK, or indeed, say, when I've done this work for Sweden recently, but slightly less onerous than the one for Sweden. Um, so firstly, we assume a highly ambitious mitigation agenda by the non-OECD countries. We assume that Ireland wants to make its fair contribution to delivering on the Paris 2 degree C commitment. So there's some sort of integrity to Ireland's position there. That Ireland's policies are to have a scientific foundation and to take account of equity that the poorer countries will take longer to make the transition. If we put all of those together, then Ireland needs to reduce its carbon dioxide emissions at around 10 to 15 percent every single year starting now. Now, that will sound incredibly uh, onerous. Firstly, I would suggest it's much less onerous than living with two, three or four degrees centigrade of warming in the poorer parts of the world. And it's certainly even in our richer parts of the world as well um, uh, over the next few decades. So difficult, but not as difficult as living with the impacts of climate change. And we should have it would have been much lower if we'd started to act earlier. But we have to remember we have chosen for 27 to 28 years politically and socially not to respond to the challenges of climate change. So we have used up most of the carbon budget. Ireland would need to have about a 60 to 75 percent reduction in its carbon dioxide by about 2025 and approach full decarbonisation from the energy system by about 2035 to 2040. So zero carbon energy, not just electricity. That's planes, ships, refrigerators, cars, everything. And alongside that, there really needs to be some very major mitigation from the agricultural sector. Ireland's non carbon dioxide greenhouse gases, gases must also be significantly reduced. So is two degrees C mitigation still possible? Because this sound, sounds incredibly difficult. Well, my argument is yes, it is and just. I think within a few years time, we will have lost the opportunity for two degrees centigrade. But at the moment, I think it still remains just about viable. We will need deep and rapid changes in the behaviours and practices of those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions. Now, we could be doing this immediately. Now, the next few points on this slide are taken at the global level, but I'm sure in Ireland there is similar inequality here. The, the top 10% of global emitters are responsible for about 50% of global emissions. If we reduce the footprint of that top 10%, just at the level of the average European, so not really that onerous, then that would be a one third cut in global emissions. It just shows the massive asymmetry, the imbalance we see in who is responsible for the emissions. And I'm sure this is the case within Ireland as well, or something very similar to this. And of course, if those people, those of us, like professors, for instance, at universities, who are responsible for the lion's share of the emissions, did start to drive our own behaviours differently, we would help to catalyse system change and legitimise stronger government legislation to drive emissions down through our different behaviours, low carbon behaviours and practices. Then in the near term, we need very stringent efficiency standards on our end use appliances. And we can all cry, well, OK, the EU legislation makes this challenging. But we have to recognise that climate change is more important than the, than the petty differences and difficulties we have with current legislation. We need to establish very stringent efficiency standards. And when I talk in lectures and a lot of the students have their laptops out, I always point out the difference in efficiency between the laptops will probably be a, be a factor of two. And that's the same for our cars. Many people will be driving cars um, in Ireland that have emissions of, say, 150 to 200 grams of carbon dioxide for every kilometre. But there are plenty of cars available, normal diesel and petrol cars, at 100 grams, half the emissions. And indeed, of course, there are some increasingly electric cars at much lower than that as well. So existing technologies allow us to have much um, lower emissions. We should tighten these standards year on year. We'll hear the financial directors of the companies will squeal, but the engineers will just get on and do it. And this will provide a long term and dynamic market signal to the manufacturers of the appliances that we use. And if you combine on the demand side here, both the behaviours and the technologies, I would argue if we really felt climate change was an important issue, which currently I've not seen much evidence that we do, but if we did, then I think you could deliver in the OECD countries reductions in our actual energy use and therefore in our emissions of 40 to 70 percent in 10 to 15 years. And the important thing about that, that gives us a longer opportunity, of, uh, extends the window for putting in low carbon energy supply. And that's the third part here. We need a Marshall style decarbonisation of energy supply. That's like the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. Now, there are plenty of things we can do. You've got geothermal power, wind power, arguably nuclear, dams, solar. There's a whole array of um, options that are zero or very low carbon. 
But most of these, you'll be aware, are actually generating electricity. And currently, electricity is just about 20% of our final energy demand. So of the energy we use, only about 20% is electricity. Much of it is heat. And then obviously, we use a lot of other oil and gas and so forth in transport. So we need a major program of electrification, probably three to five times the current grid size. So we start to put much of industry's heating, domestic heating, cars, transport and so forth. Much of that will have to go on the grid where we can make zero carbon electricity. Now, this is a sort of 30 year retooling of society's productive capacity, where that's retrofitting the poor quality of houses you have in Ireland and indeed in the UK to meet the sort of standards we need for the 21st century or whether it's electrification of our um, uh, um, of the cables and the charging points for, say, transport, or just making the big shift across to electrical electrical energy. This is a a long term jobs agenda, and in that sense, I think can have a can offer a lot of opportunities for prosperity in our countries. There has to go along with this a rapid shift away from all fossil fuels, including peat, which of course Ireland still burns, and we need to recognise we have to cease any further exploration for fossil fuels. For two degrees centigrade around 70 to 80 percent of known fossil fuel reserves have to remain in the ground. For 1.5 degrees centigrade, it is still more than that. In 2017, climate change is system change. And it is our fault it's got to this position because we have chosen to fail, as I said earlier, for 27 to 28 years on climate change. So if we want to interpret Paris now through appropriate science, the logic of carbon budgets, then that will beg fundamental questions of our norms and our paradigms. We need this Marshall style transition in supply technologies. We need rapid penetration of the most efficient end use technologies, not just choices, but actually regulations that start to force more efficient appliances. We need a profound shift in behavior and practices, particularly by those of us who are the high emitters. We need to develop economic models that are fit for purpose. And I would argue the current market neoclassical models cannot deal with the system level changes that we are now trying to address. So perhaps ecological economics could provide some more guidance there. We need to be much more serious and honest in our recognition of inter and intergenerational equity in terms of our concern for our own children's future, but also of course, concern for other parts of the world who already suffer the impacts of our emissions today. And Building on that, we need to have some major reparation, not aid for poorer countries. We have forced and knowingly imposed climate change on them. Many of these countries are more climately vulnerable in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, we have also asked them not to use fossil fuels to develop as we, of course, developed using fossil fuels. So it's like a double whammy that we've imposed upon them. So we need to help them make that very difficult leapfrog over where we have been in terms of high carbon infrastructure to a low carbon future. And this has to start now and all be completed within about three decades. So this is a radical shift in how we have to see the world. The future will be radically different from today. It will be different because we've either had the integrity to drive a mitigation gender in line with broadly the science, or because we have chosen to fail still further, and then we'll be impacted by the um, rising climate change instabilities. So either way, the future is radically different to the present. But I'm going to finish with a message of hope here, which I regularly use from Robert Unger, that at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. And that is our job as academics, as politicians, to imagine a prosperous, sustainable, low carbon future. But not just imagine it, to say, well, what do we need to do today to bring that about? That's the clarity part. That's the job of the academics and the politicians to say, well, what do we need to do today? And my understanding is that the uh, proposed legislation is broadly in line with what we need to do today to, to imagine and to deliver uh, a sustainable, low carbon, prosperous future for our own children. So I think Robert Unger catches that well in this quote. So on that point, very, uh, thank you very much for listening.